Okay, everybody. All right, before we get back into um, uh, lecture for this week, um, the next assignment is coming up. It's actually your, your last individual assignment. We'll talk about the term paper and the final exam um, later. Uh, but for, uh, for all of you here, um, well, first of all, in general, the assignment is a, uh, another article assessment. There are two articles here. Both of those are uh, regarding avatar creation, self-representation, and so on in virtual environments. But uh, for all of you here, I'm not going to change the instruct instructions here on Canvas. Uh, but for those of you who actually are here or listen to this lecture, I'm going to offer an alternative if you would prefer. Um, up here on Canvas in part eight, which is this unit here, uh, there's a link to a video up on YouTube, uh, which is regarding, whoops, which was regarding several games uh, and interesting ways that designers managed to improve the game based upon essentially the behavior of the players. And that's this whole unit is basically talking about the, about our behavior in virtual environments and the way that games set up rules and people mess with the rules and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, so, for example, uh, in this video, it talks about how um, the, uh, the, the Wii Mario platformer, not, it's the multiplayer one, what the hell is it called? So, uh, what was that? Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, whatever it is. It was a multiplayer Super Mario Brothers. Uh, and if you've ever played the classic version on, on NES, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a pain to play. Me and my brother used to play all the time. And you had to do that thing where you, you, you know, trade off back and forth, trading the controllers. And all that. So as consoles developed, uh, we're capable of more things at once and there was simultaneous co-op and so on. Uh, well, by the time you get to the Wii version of the Mario Brothers platformer, you run into a different problem uh, which is similar to what you had at, uh, during the old days of the NES, which was that one player is just sitting there doing nothing while the other one is playing. So me, of course, being an expert gamer, my brother never really got to play. <laughs> I would just, I'll go first, and that would be it. Um, well, the, uh, the way that it was handled eventually on the Wii platform uh, was, well, they did a couple of things. And it's in this video, if you, if you want the details on it, this is going to be the best of my recollection. Uh, but the uh, the first thing that they did, of course, is they, they mess with the game's rules and the level design uh, in order to spread power ups out more. So that multiplayer, when there's more than one person playing at the same time, uh, the amount of power ups is more evenly distributed or technically more evenly distributed between the players. Uh, but they didn't stop there. They kept going to try and find an even better solution. And what they eventually came upon is probably the, the best possible solution in this scenario, which is uh, that rather than uh, a one of multiplayer uh, dying and then having to wait until the level is completed to rejoin the game, instead, what they did is the dead player bubbles and floats along until the existing players go and pop the bubble and they can rejoin the game, which not only keeps all co-op players interested and invested in the game without having to worry too much about uh, dragging everybody down, uh, but it gives multiplayers with disparate skill levels the ability to essentially die and then let the more skilled player pass the more difficult part and then pop them so that they can rejoin. There's none of that waiting around. So it's not something that they had to do, but in response to player behavior, it made a lot of sense. This video is full of things like that. Not a single one of these uh, games that he talks about here is an example of the uh, designers solving a, a problem that's based on a technical challenge. It's all based on on player behavior, such as the Gears of War uh, old reload system, uh, which was an interactive sort of mini game at first that they ended up having to adjust uh, because it did not work in players' hands the way they expected it to work when they initially 
tested it in uh, in house. So if you would prefer, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, write a paper instead, uh, either an example from that video or one that you can think of on your own. You don't need to seek approval for it. Just go ahead and, and have at it. If not, uh, then it'll be an article assessment. There's two articles there about avatars in virtual worlds. You can also do the uh, Proteus article that's also linked in this unit uh, down here, the Proteus effect. You can do that one as well. I don't have a problem with that. And it will just be um, another substantive and contextual analysis. Oh, the only thing I want to mention to everybody, your, your papers uh, by and large in this class have been good. Uh, but I do want to uh, at least uh, make sure that you keep in mind that if you're doing academic writing, that you do need to cite your sources. So there should always be, if you're doing an article assessment, there's at least one source, <laughs> and that would be the article. You should have more, but there will be at least one. You don't forget to cite those because that is very important. Okay. All right. That's where we were. All right, so last time we did talk about the uh, Proteus effect, about how in virtual systems, um, the player is control of an avatar, but the avatar, uh, their behavior can <clears throat> change. Uh, the player's behavior as well, if we go back just a little bit here. Um, for example, so compelling uh, is our need or our desire rather to customize our avatars uh, that we spend real money on otherwise free games. Uh, we uh, behave more in line with our avatar. If we are presented one that is, uh, for lack of a better term, physically attractive or tall, we uh, react accordingly. It affects our behavioral schema and our persona within the context of the game. And in some cases, uh, we'll also, there we go, we'll also influence our behavior outside of the game uh, by giving us essentially avatars that move with us, that change with us, um, I mean, we're, we're all essentially granted an identity at birth, one which we don't really have a whole lot of say in. And as they say on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Um, but in the end, we end up bringing a lot of that baggage along with us. Part of the reason we bring that baggage along with us is because there's a good uh, section of our society, of course, that benefits greatly uh, from those otherwise immutable characteristics in real life. But uh, not only is it their insistence on bringing those things online that causes us to do so, it's a, an important part, almost an indelible part, as it turns out, which we did learn not until there was such a thing as virtual worlds, uh, that it is part of our identity. There is a, an aspect of those characteristics that we, we take with us because it is intrinsically us. But when given an option to self-represent in other ways, we don't necessarily choose those exact features for us. It's more of an idealized state, sometimes even um, one that is not necessarily based on those otherwise immutable characteristics in real, in real life, but maybe a reflection of our insecurities and our, um, our desires and so on, right? So we spend a lot of time and we tend to be more immersed in experiences that allow us to customize that experience or at least the way that we are represented uh, to the point where, as I mentioned, my daughter will spend uh, more than half of her time playing a game, not playing a game, simply customizing her avatars over and over again. And she's moved on to at least seven or eight iterations since I took these pictures earlier this year. Um, and uh, as I said, otherwise free experiences, such as the game Roblox, which is marketed at, at gamers that are 16 and under by and large. Um, otherwise, mostly uh, the game itself is free. It doesn't cost anything to actually sign up. Most experiences don't cost anything. Uh, they make all of their money and they did go public earlier, um, a couple of years ago rather. Um, so their, their revenue is known. But in a game where basically you create games for free and let your, your friends play for free, you can monetize it within game items and cosmetics. And they seem to be doing pretty well for themselves so far. Now there are some uh, larger games out there that are more monetized. In the end, what we're really talking about here is very small, simple games for children that make plenty of money based on uh, the in-game currency transactions. So when we have an avatar uh, that represents us, we're more immersed, we're more compelled, we're more likely to interact with the world for longer, but also our interactions with those uh, that world are, are likely to leave uh, a more lasting mark on us. So when we have an avatar that changes with us, that reflects us, 
that we can improve and we can alter in any way, uh, as that study showed earlier from Yi, um, particularly with physically interactive games, it inspires those who have that avatar uh, to continue that physical activity even when not playing the game, um, and uh, to essentially try to level up in real life. This is why gamification is the buzzword in the cybersecurity industry, and it has been for the last couple of years. We've really been seeking a way to, to harness that. How do we social engineer people to do what we want to do? Traditionally, that's been with training programs, which the efficacy of which has been notoriously spotty since the very idea first crept up. It's just that the question then is, well, what is the best way to do it? What other way can we do it? We don't really have a good answer, which is why gamification is sort of the order of the day. Uh, there's tons tons of products and programs out there that seek to, or at least promise to, harness the Proteus effect. It's the ability to influence users and train schemas beyond traditional work schemas and, uh, and get that information through people's heads, you know, so that it becomes part of their thought patterns more than anything else. And yeah, while, you know, more likely what we're seeing these days with microtransactions and loot boxes and whatnot is, is really more marketing, using games to market, the idea that we could harness these to teach people uh, is not lost on anyone. It's certainly not an original idea here. Question is, is that most games that seek to teach us really suck? A couple of reasons why that happens to be. Uh, but before we get there, well, before we can understand why learning games suck, I guess, <laughs> we need to understand some limiting factors and, and what exactly is a game's ability to, uh, to influence us. So this is about where we left off uh, last time. So what do we like about games? What would a good uh, game look like? And does a teaching game or can an educational teaching game meet these requirements? Can we have a game? Well, I mean, there's plenty of games out there with virtual exploitation. Right, it's a it's a, a virtual world. We can do absolutely anything with it. I mean, imagination is our primary limiting factor, and technology is our secondary limiting factor. Um, but there's plenty of open world games out there. Part of their appeal is the ability to explore. And most open game worlds that don't do very well tend to do poorly because they offer only an open game world ostensibly. In reality, it's mostly empty. I'm trying to think of some examples. I mean, like, so I, I can think of a bunch of smaller titles, but that's not exactly fair. Yeah, that's actually a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, now that you mentioned that, that one's notorious for it. Yeah. Uh, open world game, and it's just, there's nothing there. Right? It's just empty. There is a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like school lunch. It's not very good, but there sure is a lot of it. Yeah. Um, so we like the exploration aspects, but there has to be a process of discovery. There has to be something in there that allows us to, to feel connected to the world, attached to the world, to see that it's a, a living world. This is why GTA Online, despite the fact that it's, I mean, real long in the tooth as far as games are concerned these days, is still really popular because, you know, San Andreas is a living city. Um, also, part of the reason why it's so popular is because of the social aspect to it. We tend to be more immersed in games uh, that have other actual players. Uh, convincing AIs aside, uh, there has not yet been an NPC that has existed that has managed to fool real world players for too long. Um, I've played a couple of uh, experimental games in my day. Um, anyone here familiar with the, uh, the concept of the, uh, the uh, Chinese room? experiment. Yeah, I played a couple of games that were built on that concept. Uh, if you're not familiar with the, Ch the Chinese room, it's a, it's a, a, a Turian-esque thought experiment regarding uh, AI. Uh, essentially, imagine yourself in a room. There's one door in the room. It's got a slot in it. It's barely wide enough to fit a piece of paper through. You have uh, in your room, uh, you're an English speaker, of course, you have in your room essentially a dictionary or a translator that will translate anything you say in English uh, into Mandarin, for example. That's why they call it the Chinese room. And the thought experiment is that you and another entity uh, in the room next door need to exchange messages. However, they have a Mandarin to English dictionary. You have the English to Mandarin dictionary. And the idea is that the entity on the other side of the room may be an AI. That could be translation. 
uh, or there may be another actual person. And how do you surmise the actual identity of the person across the room, or, or could you even? So sort of uh, AI thought experiment similar to the uh, voight Tom tests and so on uh, from Blade Runner on how to determine or, or what essentially is the essence uh, of actual intelligence or sentience, right? Because there's a difference, as we've been talking about uh, in weeks past, between, uh, between having information uh, and having knowledge. And unless you're a native speaker, you may be able to, for example, Google, Google Translate your way through a conversation. Uh, but you'll never have the level of knowing uh, of an actual fluent speaker to be able to convey the actual sentiment and subtext that goes along with languages. So an AI that's able to speak, quote unquote, speak uh, various different languages um, is that sentience just because they can translate, just because they can understand uh, is that really, um, is that really thought, I suppose, at the end of the day. Anyway, that was a long derail from saying most NPCs suck. Um, you know, we just don't have uh, them available. Most of them are, are going to be pre-scripted. So having games were more immersed when there are actual social stakes at play here. Uh, the last time um, we talked about this, I think I mentioned Fallout 76 in this regard. Uh, Fallout 76 is uh, an MMO. There's lots of uh, players out there. Well, not lots. It's not that popular of a game. Uh, but there's players out there. Most servers are going to be populated at least, you know, a bit. Um, so there's other players to interact with. But uh, where Bethesda fell short in this respect is uh, during launch, they wanted to, to please everybody in, in this, uh, in regards to the social game. So rather than doing the typical route of going with PVP and PVE servers, which is you know, what World of Warcraft and so on do, uh, they went with the route instead of having individualized PVP flagging. Um, so anyway, what it amounted to is essentially probably the, uh, the friendliest player base you're ever gonna find in an MMO. If you log on, you're more likely to get help than you are anything else. Um, and so there's no social stakes, there's no aspect. I actually thought of another really good example in the class last time, a game called Path of Exile, which is a, uh, an RPGs game with a skill tree and all kinds of stuff. Um, the thing is, is it, it is an MMO, uh, but uh, rather than having friendly players out there, it's more like most servers are pretty much dead uh, because while there are other players and uh, you can, you know, do things with them and team up and whatnot. Uh, there's actually no reason not to. The way the game is structured, you can pretty much handle most challenges solo. And they did that intentionally because, you know, they didn't have a large player base. They wanted to make sure the players that did play the game could participate in the content. And so uh, there's no social stakes there either. And, uh, while they're both fine games, they just don't have that immersion. They don't have that factor that draws people in and keeps them engaged because it is other people. That's part of the compelling aspect of it. Um, contextual adaptation, adjusting and responding to social cultural context and so on, right? We don't like a game that's static. Um, even RuneScape, <laughs> even RuneScape has changed over the years. Um, uh, we like that, uh, that lore getting in there. We wanna see stuff from the, uh, the, the outside making its way in and vice versa. It's just, uh, again, part of the, uh, the immersion factor. And then of course, the ability to have identity flexibility, at least to the point of customizing the character. Those are the things that really make us interested in a game or, or maintain uh, interest in a game, I guess I should say. There's plenty of games out there that will find games that don't do this, don't do these things. Really is, there's lots of different kinds of games out there. So, um, but those that tend to last the longest do tend to do all these things. So the question is, is could we have uh, a learning game that does all of these things, that really draws people in and really teaches them something. Well, I can't think of any learning games that actually do that. I've played about 120 cybersecurity educational games over the last year or so. Well, cybersecurity slash like teaching games for you know, programming and uh, assembly and, and so throwing all of those together. I played a lot of them. Um, and I can't think of any of them that actually do all or even most of these things. So uh, there is one other uh, aspect here of uh, our ability to influence behavior. Uh, and the question is, is that when it comes to learning games, uh, can we, 
can a learning game influence behavior or does it have to be is is essentially the fun is that part of the learning process is that part of the process of influencing in virtual worlds well there has been a test on this um, but before we can talk about that experiment uh, we need to talk about the milgram obedience experiment if you're not familiar with it i'm just giving you the broad strokes here because my assumption is uh, it might have been a while since you had your last psych class and and i don't know if they even talk about this uh, in the intro to psych but the milgram experiment is a very famous experiment uh basic premise uh is you have uh an individual answers an ad in the paper they come in five dollars just for coming in they don't have to actually participate in the experiment uh, they're sat down, uh, they're given a bogus personality quiz and stuff. It's not really important to the experiment, but in the end, uh, they are told that they and another participant are going to, well, they've been selected to move on to the next round of experimentation. And so um, the person who responded to the ad and another uh, test subject who's actually a confederate, um, a paid actor in this case, um, are separated. The respondent, the actual test subject, is sat down uh, at a machine with buttons uh, and uh, a lever that increases the intensity, they say, of electric shocks. The other test subject, the actor, is put into a separate room and hooked up to a machine. Um, they cannot see each other, the actor or the test subject, but they know that they're there. And essentially, uh, that experiment was run a number of times. In the original version, um, the experimenter who uh, is another confederate of the of milgram the actual experimenter wearing a white lab coat carrying a clipboard and all of that uh, essentially instructs the test subjects to um, induce shocks to the individual um, it's something really simple i believe in the milgram experiment um, it was a call and answer game where the test subject and the confederate actor um, were sat down and they were meant to uh, memorize the order of certain words like um what was uh what was the uh <laughs> man person woman camera tv like a series of words and uh, if the actor got the order wrong they received a shock something simple like that well uh, of course the confederate intentionally started throwing the answers and um the test subject induced shocks in them um, in their mind, up to a certain point until they experience some discomfort, at which point uh, the experimenter in the white lab coat uh, would tell them a series of escalating um, lines to increase social pressure on them to continue the test. So the first time it would be something like, uh, that is an incorrect answer, you should press the button. And if they refuse to, then they would say, that answer was incorrect you must press the button and then finally they would say it is absolutely essential that you press the button for the experiment to continue so increasing amounts of, of pressure just in rewording their prodding long story short at the end of the original milgram experiment they found uh, that 65 percent of the test subjects would conform to these instructions even when voltage increased to a point where the test subject had been warned uh, would be quite uncomfortable or even potentially fatal to the other test subject. The idea of the uh, Milgram was experiment was to try and test, uh, this was of course post-World War II, uh, to test a person's response to authority, their willingness to inflict harm upon somebody else if they were instructed to do so by somebody else, not necessarily completely under their own um, agency. So what we found uh, with subsequent runs of the Milgram experiment is that essentially uh, conformity was all but assured if there was a layer of abstraction between the act and the order. So if the white lab coat was lost and instead it was just somebody in street clothes, people were less likely to conform to those orders. They just didn't listen. If they decided instead of uh, Yale, where the original Milgram experiment was run, they did it in some rundown offices, well, that's still a fairly high, almost alarmingly high percentage, but at least less than half uh, would say, are you sure that you're a real scientist and would abandon the, the, the uh, study? Um, in, uh, if, the, uh, if there was less of a layer of abstraction between the victim and the one who pressed the button, uh, there also would be 
um, uh, lower likelihood of obedience that the, uh, the, the teacher had to physically touch the learner. They, they had a connection prior to their being separated or if uh, the learner could see, um, sorry, if the teacher could see, the test subject could see the confederate in the other room. Uh, less of an abstraction between them and so less likely to um, comply. But the three that are really important here for this context is number one, um, 10%, only 10% would, would comply uh, with orders from somebody in a white lab coat with a clipboard if the teacher, the test subject in this case, if there was a third confederate added to the experiment that would vocally object, that would say, you can't press that button, you're gonna hurt somebody. This is quackery, what do you think you're doing? But in the presence of other disobedient participants, they dramatically reduce their compliance rate. They would instead say, yeah, they're right. What are you doing? What are we doing here? Um, if authority was not present. So the person in the lab coat um, said, continue the experiment. I will return shortly. Um, what they found uh, is that only 20.5% would actually continue the experiment. Many of them, uh, essentially what they would do is they would shock the learner. They would press the button. Uh, but they would forget conveniently to increase the voltage. So they would continue to shock them harmlessly, though alarmingly, until authority returned. And in 92.5% of cases, so the highest level of compliance that they found in any of the subsequent experiments is that if they were allowed to tell somebody else to push the button, then they would gladly give the order to do so. Now, the uh, Milgram experiments, the reason we're talking about them is because uh, there were subsequent experiments later on uh, for how this might work in a virtual environment, right? So the idea then is that because worlds are virtual, then uh, the uh, answer must be uh, that that is the absolute abstraction, right? They're, they're, you can't be more abstract than just harming virtual characters. Um, and so we can expect immorality uh, to, to rule the day. Uh, the answer in what was known as the Pena experiment, Jorge Pena ran this experiment a number of years ago. Uh, the answer is no. It turns out that that's not the case, but it does depend. Um, yeah, uh, it turns out virtual worlds are a perfectly normal place uh, for, for people to experiment. Uh, even in doing things that are otherwise in real life frowned upon or destructive, uh, but generally uh, not necessarily with destruction itself as the goal. Um, like, you know, if you've played Skyrim, who hasn't uh, at one point or another uh, gotten fed up with hearing about the fucking cloud district and decided to just burn the whole goddamn place down? But what do you do? You quick save first, right? So you can go back to go back to the <laughs> the place where things aren't completely screwed up and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's not necessarily right an expression of dark tetrad traits. It's experimenting in a virtual environment in a way in which you know consequences. There's you're free of them, right? There's there's not going to be long term or even permanent uh, damage to anything as a result. And there are some games, of course, uh, where you play a villain. Right, um, and there are some where you play the hero. So what the Pena experiment tested uh, is number one, to see if people uh, in a virtual environment would gladly indulge in dark tetrad impulses, would gladly uh, take their, their real life frustrations out on NPCs or even other players. Uh, the answer was no, uh, but mostly only when their role as they saw it changed. So players would gladly adopt monikers, would gladly adopt avatars and personalities, and they would do the duties of that personality. So in a game, in Pena's experiment, uh, where players were either superheroes or supervillains, um, those who played supervillains, they did gladly fall into that role. Right? They, would, they would gladly harm NPCs. But if they played superheroes, even if instructed to do so by an authority, even if told by the game that they had to, well, those who played heroes were less likely to bother NPCs, to harm them, 
and more likely to feel guilty about it after they do. If you've ever actually played the, uh, the story mode in GTA 5, you know that there's a notorious scene which involves Trevor torturing another individual in order to, uh, to get information out of him. Um, it's a scene that sticks with a lot of people who played it. So if you remember it, you're in good company here. Um, but what makes that scene so uncomfortable is because even though Trevor is supposed to be a dirtbag, by that point in the game, uh, if you've been playing Trevor, you know, he's not necessarily all bad. And so a lot of players are conflicted at that scene because he's a scumbag, uh, but uh, it's kind of even beyond the pale for his character at that point in the game. And so uh, there's actual numbers on this. Steam likes to collect as far as uh, viewer engagement in different parts of different games. I shouldn't say Steam. Steam collects it on behalf of developers, but the developers put it out there as well. So Rockstar put this out there not that long ago. Uh, and uh, players during that scene will often uh, wait until prompted several times to continue. And in some cases, I think it's, a, it's an incredibly high number for the game. It's something like, I want to say 13%, but I haven't seen the numbers recently. But a good number of players get to that point and then they just stop playing. They just don't complete. <laughs> they just sit there and wait for it to be done. Uh, or they just stop playing all together. So uh, as it turns out, uh, in real life, we see authority figures different. And what we consider to be authority figures is very impactful on our behavior. We are um, taught from a very young age what our role is in society, essentially. No, no, not one of us is, is, uh, is really uh, in a position where we feel confident, capable enough uh, to really challenge authority, unless uh, we see other people who we respect doing so, or unless we can get away with it without getting in trouble from authority, or when we ourselves are put in positions of authority. That doesn't mean that we are necessarily ready to make our own decisions. We still, by and large, overwhelmingly, still comply with what the upper authorities tell us to do. You know, everybody's got a boss. Boss has a boss that goes all the way up. Somebody, we all assume, at the very top of the pyramid, the ultimate decision maker, the great master brain leading us all to a utopia. Uh, it's because we don't have that much of a picture. We don't have a big picture. But in a game where we are told that we are superheroes, what do superheroes do? Do superheroes hurt people? No. They're idealized, superheroes themselves are idealized versions of, uh, of, of our humanity. Right? of all of ourselves, unless you're watching the boys or something. But, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we play that role. Superheroes have a duty to protect, to not harm people and so on. They have a, a code of ethics and, and all of that. And so as the Pena experiment shows, um, we don't necessarily just comply, right? And as a matter of fact, um, this, the Pena experiment, in, in the world of criminology and criminal justice uh, is actually really interesting because what it tells us uh, is that if, um, well, <laughs> no, no secret, right? Our criminal justice system is meant to be rehabilitative, but it, it, it's really not. It's also meant to be retributive and, and all of that. So it's kind of a mix of various different things, but rehabilitation is, is very low in terms of what it's actually accomplishing uh, in any given punishment. But the idea, that we could potentially rehabilitate people, people who otherwise have a very high recidivism rate uh, with some kind of gamification like this. It's a, it's a real possibility. So uh, games uh, can influence people. Um, and I know that just hearing that, <laughs> if you're anything like me, just hearing somebody say that can be a terrifying prospect because nine times out of 10, when you hear somebody say that games can influence behavior, what you hear right afterwards is they inspire people to go on shooting rampages or, or what have you. And maybe that's just me, a little bit of, a, little bit of a, a sardonic view, I guess. Uh, years, years of that kind of stuff will do that. Uh, so uh, they can influence, but not in the way that most people think, not in the way where the purveyors of moral panic uh, would say that games are corrupting youth. Uh, there have been actually a lot of studies on this as well. I, I didn't bother to cite any one of them because there's a lot of them. 
uh, right? It's an idea that's gained a lot of traction. So of course, there's gonna be a lot of academics out there that wanna study it. Um, I can think of at least a dozen that I've personally read on the matter. Uh, but as it turns out, no, games do not exacerbate or cause dark tetrad traits to manifest. We don't know what causes people to have dark tetrad traits. It's a combination of combination of nature and nurture, um, and it's far too complicated of a question to, to really lay at the feet of any one piece of media, even one that's interactive, um, even one that can influence our behavior. Let's say that we did have a game that glorified uh, violence and, and so on, like uh, Serious Sam or, or or that one game that that guy came up with that's about being a school shooter or something like that. I can't remember what it was called. It was pulled like days after it was released on Steam. Is that it? That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, <laughs> there definitely was. Um, but yeah, even even games like that, right? It's it's not necessarily going to inspire any. What it, what it might do if anything, uh, is uh, normalize and glorify that kind of behavior for somebody who already has a proclivity for that kind of thought. But in any event, uh, we can say for certain that there, it is possible for games to influence behavior, right? Um, we do even know that games can influence cognition, which means that games technically can teach. Uh, there was actually a study released a couple of weeks ago, I remember seeing it on, um, oh, I don't remember where it was. I got, it, uh, I got an alert in my email on it. Um, anyway, but whatever, wherever it was, uh, a couple of days ago, um, talking about how, um, you know, exposure to games uh, from a younger age tends to not, for a while, uh, the idea was that it leads to better hand-eye coordination and all that kind of stuff. It uh, turns out that that's not the case. Uh, but what it does do is it leads to improvement in cognition, particularly in terms of problem solving, resource management. I mean, Jesus Christ, if you play Tarkov, you become master. Uh, <laughs> you, could pack, you could pack your entire house into a single station wagon after playing that game for a couple of days. Uh, but yeah, things like that. It, it does train your brain, right? You, you do become better at certain things, uh, studies show. So we can teach with games. So knowing all of that, knowing that uh, self-representation is important, knowing that roles are important, that perception of authority is important, that exploration and all of that other stuff is important. If we know they can teach, then why do training or learning games suck so much? And the answer from what I've seen after 120 some odd games uh, is that they tend to have very low user interactivity, very low user immersion, and outcomes are not associated with idealization but with rational outcomes. Training games are very matter of fact and they tend to rationalize the teaching process. Uh, in fact, I have a list of what I consider to be good training games. League of Legends. <laughs> that is a training game after a fashion. <laughs> you get to learn to use your eyes. Shout out Flat Stands Week Report. Uh, so yeah, my list of, of good games that you can you can try for training. Um, like Squally, for example, that's a great one for learning assembly, but there's no customization. It's a side-scrolling platformer. It's got a, a Gwent-style in-game card game, um, but that's really about it. Once the game is over, what much? how much do you retain? Well, not a whole lot. Um, I mean, even having a real-life version of the cards to use in class in a teaching context would probably provide more assembly instruction than actually running through the game but at least it's realistic and not insulting. So that's why it's on the list. That's one of my criteria. Greyhack is uh, uh, an analog for uh, penetration test. Problem is, is that it is also, so it's one of those games where it's true to life-ish and you use actual tools and use them in the actual right way. 
Uh, the problem is, is that if you approach the game as an absolute beginner, you're not going to know what to do. And by the time you do know what to do, well, then the game is just going to confuse you because it's a game, not the actual real thing. Um, Thread Gen Red versus Blue I've played, and it's one of those games where it's, it's supposed to be uh, sort of a turn-based RTS, where one team is the blue team, the other one is the red team. Red team's trying to attack the blue team and vice versa. And uh, the red side is boring because it's a clicking simulator and it's really easy because being the attacker, just the asymmetry of security, it's, you just, it's just easier on the blue team side. And we'll talk about in-game economies in a moment and how red versus blue attempts to uh, reduce that asymmetry. But just in general, it's already it's starting from a difficult place. But on the blue team side, uh, you have actual products, you're doing actual implementations, it's using actual terminology. And so in that regard, it's all very good. Um, but what do you actually learn? Well, after putting roughly 30 or 40 hours into Threat Gen Red versus Blue, I realized after five or so games on the blue team side uh, that while I, as a cybersecurity professional, recognized, you know, I recognized the, uh, the appliances and the brands and uh, the like Purdue model and um, role-based access control, like all these terms they're throwing out in the game, that after five games or so, what I had really learned to do was game the game. I, I realized what steps are optimal in terms of the game to provide a winning strategy, not necessarily what would work in real the in, uh, real. Um, Rogue Bit is a great game supposed to be for um, like reverse engineering and so on, actually step through code in the game. Um, and it's great. It's great for learning data manipulation and all that kind of stuff. But again, as with Squally, there's no customization, there's no immersion. It's more of a, a story that you're stepping through. Uh, and so at the end of the game, what do you really learn? Maybe a little bit. That's really about it. Um, and then the, the other ones, uh, this is a forensic challenge. So uh, that's not going to do you any good unless you already know how to work with forensic challenges. Um, you, know, you know what tools to use and so on. If you have a little bit of forensic experience, it's actually really easy. Um, but if you don't, then that's it. Uh, and Night Team 4 uh, is just uh, kind of your, your classic, uh, you know, um, throbbing techno music in the background, not really a very good analog, but entertaining game aspect of the game. And that, out of all of the games, I've, and again, over 100 games, most of those weren't even cybersecurity games. They were games associated with assembly or reverse engineering or forensics in one case and so on. Um, but that's the cream of the crop right? out of all of those games. Most of them are just terrible. And even those didn't have any real interactivity, didn't really have any immersion, uh, didn't really have any, uh, this is all rationalized. So at the end of the day, I remember the game, but I don't really remember anything that they, they taught. Now, and those are just games, right? That's, those are games that are on Steam. They're, they're meant to be marketable. They're meant to be sold. So a lot of what you find on there isn't going to be good. But are actual cybersecurity training products any better? Uh, the answer is no, they're just, they're not. Um, the uh, current state of gamification in training uh, is probably something that you might find, for example, on SANS or something like that. Training within the cybersecurity community generally comes down to what are known as CTFs, capture the flag events, if you're not uh, familiar with the parlance. Um, but uh, what those amount to uh, usually are gonna be training boxes, right? You get yourself a virtual machine, there's flags, you go out, you try to find them uh, and you earn points and you, you climb the ladder. Hack the box does that. Um, I came across a, another product uh, not that long ago uh, that does something similar to that, but it's a paid feature. So making money hand over fist, but do those actually work? They don't, because again, it's the same problem as gray hack. Uh, it doesn't come with a tutorial. There's no, there's no education, there's no explanation. So um, it's just um, a playground. It's just the open world, uh, but it's like starting an open world game without any idea of what to do, where to go, what the objective is, or anything like that, which some people can handle, some people can't. By and large, it's still an ineffective and inefficient way to teach and to train. Gamification for end user training uh, usually amounts to, God, I've seen some real doozies out there. Um, 
One time uh, I was contacted by a company that promised to sell the, the next solution in gamified end user training. They showed me a sample of their product that they had done for the University of Florida. Um, and it was a, a web-based cybersecurity football game. It was horrifying. I, I, the quiz is generally what we, what we rely on. I guess that's gamification to a certain certain extent, but there's no stakes and there's definitely no interactivity. There's no immersion and we're just rationalizing. Your quiz is literally the most direct route to rationalizing outcomes. It's just, how do we know you know this? We will test you. So it can be done, theoretically speaking. Has it been done? I haven't seen it yet. Uh, part of the reason that we have trouble uh, however, with virtual worlds uh, and especially with educational games, uh, is that uh, once a game is created, it's it's out of the hands of the developer, the designer. Uh, they can do patches and updates, and often they will in response to, of course, user behavior. But it's players that make the game. Developers just create the world. They control the rules, uh, but players are the ones that make it. They're the ones that uh, make the fun. They're the ones that you know. Uh, <laughs> provide developers finally with a source of income on the game to support it and so on. And some players, uh, they don't just make the game, they like to game the game, play it and play with it, break it if possible. Because um, in addition to the, the basic rules that all games will have, uh, they have to have, in order for there to be an interactive element, there has to be something for players to do. And something for players to do means that there's going to be resources and resources need an economy and they need a flow. If you're not familiar with the terms, I'll just put them up here for you. It's not really that important. This isn't the game design class, but uh, the point is, uh, is that in order for games to be games, they have to have rule. That's what gives uh, games meaning. And I'm, I'm a big fan of cheating at single player games anyway. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, I'll play the single player game until it stops getting fun. Then I'll cheat and then it'll be fun for another day or two. And then it's not fun anymore because I don't need to cheat, I have everything I need <laughs> and all that, because I, I, it breaks, it breaks the economy. The economy is where it comes from, it gives the game meaning. So while resources will come in through taps and out through drains and they can be controlled with pinches and converters and traders, at the end of the day, it, what you're really, really doing is uh, creating a game economy and economies can be messed with. And it doesn't have to be literal in-game currency, although that is a form uh, of, uh, of expenditure in the in-game economy, right? Uh, anyone here who's ever played seriously an MMO, if, you're, if you've ever been an end-game raider or something like that, right? Uh, you know that the investment that it takes to get there, just in terms of your time alone, is not insignificant. And that's not accidental, right? Even the best World of Warcraft player in the world still has to devote a certain number of hours to leveling up and, and getting all of this gear, not because uh, the best player in the world is limited by their skill, but because the game's economy, the time economy in this case, uh, is simply set up as such so that you can only gather at most X number of resources over Y number of hours. So what happens in those cases? Well, the literal economy can be crashed because if you need to trade your time for advancement, um, and let's say that advancement comes in the form, let's just say, I guess, gold in this case. Um, then uh, that means that that's time that you can't be doing something else. But if you have the opportunity to work for real money, then you can use your time to make enough money for yourself and a little extra to hire somebody else to get the gold for you. And so an entire economy of gold farmers develops where they're selling you know, X number of hours of game time. Basically, gold equates directly to X number of hours and you're paying them real money, and next thing you know, you've got an inflation problem on your hands, literal inflation in the case of the game. Um, you can uh, um, control the amounts of, let's say, drops. Let's say there's uh, a, a drop system where there's epic all the way down to common loot or something like that. Uh, you can use that as a pinch. You can reduce the drop rate of certain materials, but unless you artificially impose a limitation on that drop, other people are gonna farm it. Right? And there's gonna be an in-game economy. Most 
games in this uh, day and age, most MMOs will have some kind of auction house system or trade system or converter system or something like that, uh, where drops like that, unless they're, they're bind to account, which is an artificial construct meant to limit uh, players gaming the system, well, it's just going gonna, just gonna to flood the, uh, the auction house with that kind of information or that kind of uh, item. Rather. Um, to say nothing of gaming systems like this, uh, due to malfeasance, right? Uh, if you have resources, then you need in your game to have a place to store them. Right? You need a, a bank vault or a guild vault or something like that. Um, and uh, what do you do if somebody games the system outside the game by, for example, compromising an account, or let's say a, uh, a trusted guild member with access to the guild vault suddenly decides one day to, to raid it or something like that? Well. Uh, then you have additional problems. And this is outside of all of the other technical rules that, of course, can be broken with hacking and so on. Uh, sometimes, my daughter and I, as I said, we play Roblox. Sometimes we like to play some of the, uh, the first-person shooters. Um, let me tell you, Roblox, game with no stakes. There's no world championship of Roblox. You don't uh, get a gold star uh, for getting the most headshots or anything like that. Uh, but despite the absolute rock bottom, bare bones, stakes involved. There's still tons of people hacking the game, just tons, <laughs> just just so that they can feel uh, good about themselves. So it's it's kind of sad. But uh, yeah, so people will break the rules. They will get out there. Uh, they will game the game and they'll game the rules all they can. So uh, that's the problem. Uh, when you try to have a game be anything other than a game, making a, making a good game, uh, one that is compelling, um, is, is not in and of itself, technically speaking. You, you, you know, I just told you, that's what you need to do. Uh, but it's all of the other stuff, of course, that goes into the game, all of the, uh, the things that make it compelling to begin with and draw players in. Um, and sometimes uh, when we try to make a game that's something else, uh, it doesn't end up working too well. Which is why training games have such a, a hard time getting off the ground. They have a hard time doing the thing that they need to do because they're not compelling. But if they were compelling, would they even still be training games? Would they still be education? Also, sometimes you get other weird examples of people gaming the game, like in World of Warcraft, if you're not familiar with this phenomenon. A couple of years ago, there's actually an article here on Canvas I've linked for if you want to read it yourself. Uh, learning from World of Warcraft's virtual pandemic here. So there was a, a raid boss uh, that had an effect, uh, corrupted blood, there it is. So it's a raid boss, uh, which means that you had to go into an instance, you, you joined a group with the guild, uh, you go in, you join an instance that's, that's just isolated to just those players, and just explaining World of Warcraft if you never played. Uh, so you go into an, inst in, an instance, and that instance is isolated to just you and the members of your group. You go through a large scale dungeon, you end up fighting you know, getting treasure, fighting uh, large bosses and so on and so on. Uh, in this one um, raid here, um, Hakar, the soul flayer, uh, had an effect that he would cast on raid members called Corrupted Blood, which was like a poisoning effect. It was a, um, a, uh, a tick, so it was a, a, a dot damage over time. Um, they would basically whittle down their, their health. And so, no problem, right? Dot effects are pretty common, uh, good ways of balancing. And like I said, this is in the game dev course or whatever. Uh, a good way of balancing out uh, the amount of damage output, uh, spreading it out over a raid, um, giving the healers something to do in order to keep people topped off to, to overheal the damage over time and so on. Uh, but not usually too much of a problem because of course, if they have corrupted blood, players will die and that'll be that. They had a disease like effect basically, where uh, raid members had to spread out, as you see here, because uh, if they were within an area of effect while they were infected with corrupted blood, they'd pass it on to other raid members. But uh, what the designers failed to take into account is that players could have cosmetic items, pets, uh, which would also pick up, if they were out in a raid, uh, this particular effect. So players with the effect would die, their pets would be desummoned, and then if they went back somewhere else and the pets were resummoned, they still had the corrupted blood effect and would spread it to everybody in these major towns outside of the raid. Uh, and uh, 
it became uh, quite quite interesting uh, to to see um, this virtual digital plague just uh, sweeping all over major cities, uh, especially since that happened prior to the COVID nineteen pandemic, and it was particularly salient in uh, seeing how that was spread. Or uh, America's Army, if you're not familiar with, uh, with that one, it's a simulator slash FPS. The Army produced it specifically for propaganda slash recruiting purposes. Uh, they really wanted to, to use it to inspire America's next great generation of soldiers for the, uh, was this? Yeah, this was the Afghanistan-Iraq conflict. This was uh, after it had started, but after recruitment numbers started flagging. Um, I think, if I remember correctly. But uh, in any event, uh, while it was particularly popular in its day, it was never considered a very good game, and it, it did eventually kind of die, uh, mostly because uh, the U.S. Army realized that the recruiting potential with actual good immersive games, uh, they had no need to basically go out and reinvent the wheel, right? <laughs> There's a new COD game every other year. So they, all they got to do is make sure that they... Uh, approve that script and slap the right logos in the right places and it's all good. Um, but yeah, attempts to do that, you could say, uh, did not work out too. All right. Uh, and of course, uh, gamifying, or sorry, gaming the system uh, extends to more than just the in-game economy and the game rules. It also extends to the out-of-game economy uh, because, of course, uh, being able to monetize games is Critically important. This is something that uh, it allows games to be created, much as we might decry the current state of, uh, of the industry and um, the potential social impact of, uh, of things like loot boxes and so on. Um, you know, essentially, money has to be made in some way. I'm not sure why the uh, old way of actually selling titles seems to be not good enough anymore, but fair enough. Um, but the, uh, the truth is, is that gaming as an industry exploding in terms of its uh, popularity, uh, now multi-billion dollar industry rivaling movies, as we talked about last week. Um, but that said, despite the fact that uh, studios have to make their money, that's how the industry perpetuates itself, um, the social ills of things like loot boxes and in-game currencies and so on uh, has definitely not been an easy um, and well it, it hasn't always proved to be uh, the best business decision in the end I guess is uh, what it comes down to so for example um, loot boxes uh, basically gambling um, and uh, that's fine if because uh, games and gambling are basically governed by the same laws uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, but of course, gambling is only legal for certain people of certain ages. And so it's responsibility of those that offer uh, gambling in their game to make sure that those that are playing are of age and so on. Um, there have been a, a litany of lawsuits that have been attached to uh, loot boxes or gambling. Uh, in addition to that, in-game currency, Fortnite has been sued over their V-Bucks, Roblox has been sued over their Robux. Um, loot boxing, uh, let's see, uh, Steam has been, uh, I can't think of anybody who really hasn't been sued now, at least one point or another. As a matter of fact, even Google and Apple over mobile games, they've been sued over this as well because uh, mobile games are a major industry. Um, consoles and PC, of course, are most popular for gaming, but mobile is catching up very fast. I mean, Jesus Christ, they just had a Candy Crush ad in the sky, for God's sake. So Google and Apple have uh, been sued over this before, mobile games and their uh, loot boxes, gambling, in-game currency. Uh, my daughter has been, uh, has been playing mobile games since she was very young. And I have to make sure that I, I pay really careful attention uh, to her current subscriptions because it seems like every couple of months or so she plays a new game and next thing you know, uh, she's being charged $200 a week after a 30-day free trial. For some mobile game. Um, but anyway, luckily, Google and Apple, uh, ironically enough, ironically enough, Google and Apple uh, have been saved or will 
less likely to be saved in this case. From a couple of lawsuits in this area by hiding behind the Communications Decency Act, which if you recall from a couple of weeks ago, uh, the very act that uh, leads to a lot of games uh, being censored to begin. So uh, they basically hide behind the CDA saying that they are distributors, not publishers. And so uh, they cannot be sued for whatever any mobile game that they happen to distribute um, does. Google, and this is just my opinion, uh, has a better case for this. I don't think that Apple does. Because uh, if you recall, uh, Cubby v. CompuServe and Stratton Oakmont v. Prodigy, the difference in the outcome of those cases uh, is that Prodigy was a uh, publisher because they edited the content. They, they had editorial control. They decided what did or did not appear on their platform. Well, Google and Apple both have a system uh, whereby apps have an approval process, but Google's process is a little bit more laissez-faire. Basically scan for um, known malware and um, make sure that all of the, the contracts essentially are in place that people are giving them their 30% and whatnot. Uh, Apple seems to have a, a lot stronger control over what appears in the app store, but I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. All right, um, so yeah, moving on to other digital transgressions. So uh, not that long ago, 2008, uh, that article there is linked for you for your own edification. But, uh, the idea that you can steal things that don't actually exist uh, is, uh, is a thing, and it has been for a while. Since the very beginning of the internet, uh, stealing things that don't actually exist has been a major prop, not just in terms of, um, of intellectual property theft, in terms of actual intangible goods. And at the beginning, uh, even the Supreme Court weighed in on the issue at first saying that if there's no transfer, if there's no tangibility to an asset, then it can't literally be stolen. And so therefore things like wire fraud and whatnot don't actually exist. Uh, but that was very quickly reversed, uh, particularly in the mid nineties when money got involved with the internet. Uh, and so uh, the intangibility of an asset suddenly didn't matter so much, I guess, once millions of dollars at stake. So uh, right away with the beginning of the internet, domain names, uh, squatting, uh, and uh, domain name transfer theft, a couple of very large cases in response to that, um, and uh, lots of trademark disputes, which at the time were tried under the Lanham Act. So uh, you can steal uh, virtual items, uh, which means that uh, if, as in this Dutch case, an account were to be compromised and digital assets were to be transferred to another account uh, that would amount to theft. Somebody actually did time in that case. Um, Roblox is actually dealing with another separate lawsuit in addition to their in-game currency right now. Uh, it's an NFT-esque bait and switch problem that they have actually created for themselves. So Roblox, as I mentioned, is generally catering to a very young demographic, um, which means that most of the time, um, they're not, they're easier to dupe, I guess, is what I'm saying. Not that kids are stupid or anything, but they're naive. They haven't been crushed to dust like the rest of us yet uh, by the weight of the world. Uh, but the problem that they, uh, they're they having uh, right now with this lawsuit with Roblox is a bait and switch S, uh, just like the NFT rug pulls that are out there uh, where users can create games. They can also create cosmetic items and so on. They can sell them in the avatar store uh, Roblox gets their 30% and everything else gets to go back to the creator. So for them, it's just fine. But Roblox, because they're younger users, exercises even more editorial control over these items. And so user-created content essentially can be censored or removed by Roblox at any time at their discretion, is what it essentially amounts to. And they're being sued uh, right now by a, a pair of parents and uh, children who play Roblox, who purchased user-created content, and then Roblox decided to get rid of it and then has not been refunding any of that. So if user-created content is struck from the store, the money is gone, the item is gone, and that's it. Now, Roblox, their defense in this lawsuit is the same uh, as the defense in many cases of virtual uh, theft here, theft of virtual items which is the same argument that you hear with uh, digital rights management technology all the time these days, 
which is, well, who do you think actually owns these things? When you buy user-created content, does that mean you own the content? No, of course not. It's user-created. They still own it. You just get a copy of it or the right to use it. And so their uh, argument and the argument of many who support digital rights management is that you're not actually buying anything. You're more or less just leasing it. You're, you're entering into a contractual agreement for usage of an item. The item actually belongs to Roblox or belongs to John Deere or belongs to Tesla or belongs to Apple in these cases. But that's a whole can of worms. Let's save the rest of that for next time because otherwise I'll be here all day. See you next time.